Good evening. I'm John Marchari, the Charles Engelhard Curator and Head of the Department of Drawings and Prints. And on behalf of our director, Colin Bailey, and all of us at the Morgan, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's event. We're here to celebrate, above all, the chance to see Pontormo's visitation, recently described by New Yorker critic Peter Sheldahl as, quote, one of the damnedest great paintings of all time. The picture comes to us from the church in Carmignano, a little town outside of Florence. The church is a pilgrimage site for art historians, but even those of us who have visited were never able to see the work as it can be seen here, up close, newly restored, well lit. We're grateful for the opportunity to show the work in a small exhibition. I'd like to acknowledge the work of Jada Daman, who has been responsible for organizing the exhibition here, which is a reduced version of a show that was previously on view in Florence and which will be at the Getty in early 2019. The curator of the exhibition at the Getty, Davide Gasparotto, is our speaker tonight. Davide is the senior curator of paintings at the Getty, a position he's held since 2014. In his four years there, the museum has acquired major paintings by Parmigianino, Orazio Gentileschi, Fatto, and others. Davide has also been the curator of a number of exhibitions, most recently Giovanni Bellini, Landscapes of Faith in Renaissance Venice, held earlier this year. Prior to moving to Los Angeles, he was from 2012 to 2014, the director of the Galleria Estense in Modena, and for 12 years before that, a curator at the Galleria Nazionale in Parma and at the, uh, at the office of the Soprintendenza e Beni Artistici of Parma and Piacenza. Tonight, Davide looks at the visitation and other works that Pontormo created in the late 1520s during the siege of Florence and the return to power of the Medici. Please welcome him for a talk entitled Pontormo from Drawing to Painting. Davide. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, John, for this very kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here in New York at the Morgan Library. We had a wonderful collaboration for this project on Pontormo, uh, working closely with the colleagues here at the Morgan, with Jada Damen especially. And uh, this exhibition, uh, as you probably know, started in Florence and then traveled here and then will travel to Los Angeles uh, at the beginning of the next year. And its uh, focus, its centerpiece, is this uh, fabulous uh, masterpiece, uh, one of the greatest uh, Italian paintings of the early 16th century by Pontormo, The Visitation, which I will approach a kind of at the end, toward the end of my talk. After the shocking sack of Rome in May 1527, the Florentines had thrown off Medici rule and established a republic, continuing to participate in the war on the side of the French. But when in 1529, severe French defeats forced King Francis I of France to conclude a peace treaty with the Emperor Charles V, and shortly afterward, also Pope Clement VII and the Republic of Venice came to an agreement with the emperor. Here we can see Clement, the Pope Clement VII. Florence was left to fight alone. As part of the agreement, Charles V promised to the Pope, born Giulio de' Medici, to restore the hegemony of his family over the city. A large imperial and Spanish army surrounded the city, and after a devastating siege that lasted nearly 10 months from October 24, 1529 to August 12, 1530, captured it, overthrowing the Republic and installing Alessandro de' Medici as Duke of Florence. You can see here the city and the imperial and Spanish armies. This is San Miniato al Monte, and this is the so-called Giramonte, where the um, imperial uh, artillery was placed, and all the troops surrounding the city. And this was the camp of the um, Lanzichenecchi, the um, mercenaries at the service of the emperor. 
artists loyal to the Medici, like the sculptor Baccio Bandinelli and the young painter Giorgio Vasari, left the city to take refuge in the nearby Lucca in Pisa. But others stayed. The most prestigious among them was Michelangelo, who, in spite of the Pope's effort to dissuade him, chose to side with his native city. In January 1529, he was elected to the Nove della Milizia, the ninth of the militia, and on April 6th, he was appointed governor and procurator general of the city's fortifications. The Republic was relying in his expertise as a military architect, the principal evidence of which is the magnificent series of sheets with design for fortifications today preserved in the Casa Buonarroti in Florence. In preparation for the defense of the city, a number of outlying convents and monasteries, mainly you know, in these areas, uh, um, a number of outlying convents and monasteries were destroyed, causing the loss or the displacement of numerous works of art. The wrecking squads stopped only in front of the incomparable beauty of the Last Supper, painted by a few years earlier by Andrea del Sarto, Pontormo's uh, uh, teacher, in the refectory of the convent of San Salvi. This lecture revolves around a number of paintings which Jacopo da Pontormo executed during the dramatic time of the last Florentine Republic. He was already widely acclaimed as one of the major painters active in Florence, and he has just completed, with the help of his pupil Bronzino, one of the major achievements of his career, the decoration of the Caponi Chapel in the Church of Santa Felicita, a lavish complex crowned by an unconventional altarpiece depicting the entombment of Christ, which you can see here on the left. In this mesmerizing work, Pontormo has dispensed with many standard components of the Florentine Renaissance picture in the interest of an intricately balanced formal design. The rules of perspective have been suspended and the proportions have been arbitrarily elongated. Gravity itself exerts little force and bodies seems to float upward through space. The colors consist almost entirely of blue and pinks with a few passages in green, yellow and red. And it's interesting, very interesting, that the recent, very recent restoration of this panel revealed that the picture is almost entirely painted in tempera, so not in the oil which was more customary at this time. Beauty, even a beauty achieved with artificial means, here provided a fully adequate vehicle for religious meaning. And here you can see also the detail of this figure, which is a self-portrait of Pontormo himself, and these drawings uh, was exhibited here in the exhibition until a few days ago. Unfortunately, now is for reason of exposure, was repla is replaced by the copy of Vasari's Life of Pontormo, but uh, it was possible to admire this uh, beautiful drawing, self-portrait drawing, until a few days ago here. In May 1529, Pontormo bought two vacant lots from the Ospedale degli Innocenti in Via Laura. So these are the lots that Pontormo bought. This is the Ospedale degli Innocenti. This is the um, square in front of the uh, Ospedale degli Innocenti with the, uh, with the Servi Church. Um, to build his own house in a hitherto undeveloped section of land between the Ospedale and Borgo Pinti, so the hospital and Borgo Pinti here. The area seems to be a favorite of artists in the 16th century. Andrea del Sarto, Piero di Cosimo, Perugino, Aristotele da Sangallo, Tribolo, Giovan Battista del Tasso, Cellini and Gian Bologna were among those who settled there. Pontormo stayed in the city to protect his investment and he sought commissions among Florentines who remained in spite of the danger. Some commissioned portraits to preserve their image for posterity 
wearing new fashions that assert military readiness and active support of the Republic, while others commissioned devotional works as they prayed for deliverance from strife and starvation. As well known, a major source of information regarding Pontorno's life and career is provided by Giorgio Vasari. By the way, this, this would be the house of Pontorno. Obviously, now it looks very different than it looked in the 16th century. Um, we were saying that uh, you know, a major source of information regarding Pontorno's life and career is provided by Giorgio Vasari, who wrote a life of the painter for the second edition of his famous Lives, published in 1568, 11 years after the artist's death. Despite Vasari's life of Pontormo contains crucial details for the reconstruction of the painter's career, it is also a biography to be used with caution. Vasari's characterization of the artist essentially as a loner and as an eccentric, a, char a characterization which had an enormous influence even in 20th century literature, um, was part portraying the artist as a sort of a neurotic antiliteram, was part of a subtle strat strategy to undermine Pontormo's own achievements, and it was largely the result of Vasari's rivalry with the painter and his artistic heirs at the Medici court, Bronzino and Allori, a conscious campaign to diminish their importance and consolidate Vasari's own hegemony as principal court artist. In his life of Pontormo, Vasari writes, a, uh, Vasari writes uh, about a number of works that the painter executed at the time of the siege of Florence. And among them, I quote, a picture of one braccio and a half he painted for the sister of the Hospital of the Innocenti with an infinite number of little figures, the story of the 11,000 martyrs who were condemned to death by Diocletian and all crucified in a wood. In these, Jacopo represented the battle of horsemen and nude figures, very beautiful and some most lovely little angels flying through the air who are shooting arrows at the ministers of the crucifixion. And in like manner, about the emperor who is pronouncing the condemnation are some most beautiful nude figures who are going to their death. Another picture similar to that described above, he painted for Carlo Neroni, but only with the battle of the martyrs and the angel baptizing them. And then the portrait of Carlo himself. This is Vasari. The two versions of the martyrdom which Vasari describes have long been recognized by scholars with the paintings by Pontormo in the Galleria Palatina on the left and the one from the Uffizi today generally attributed to the young Bronzino. The subject of the two pictures, which Vasari incorrectly identified as the martyr of the 11,000 under Diocletian, actually refers to the apocryphal medieval legend of Saint Acacius and the 10,000 martyrs. Acacius, a Roman general under the emperors Hadrian and Antoninus Pius, was ordered to put down a revolt in Armenia. After having converted to Christianity along with his troops, he won the battle against the rebels, thanks to the protection of his faith. However, notwithstanding his military victory, Acacius and the triumphant soldiers were attacked by the emperor and condemned to martyrdom because they had embraced the new religion. As noticed by previous scholars, for the painting destined for the Spedale degli Innocenti, so this one, Pontormo used the subject and composition he had prepared around 1521-1522 for the decoration of the chapel of the Confraternity of the Martyrs in the Church of San Salvatore di Camaldoli in Florence. A large red chalk preparatory drawing for that commission survives in Hamburg, although the project was never begun due to an outbreak of the plague in Florence in 1522. In this dynamic composition, Pontormo depicted the baptism of Acacia's troop in the background here, um, and in the foreground, the victory against the rebel army, a victory won thanks to angelic intervention. He used this composition a few years later for the painting 
for the Innocenti. Enriched by the addition of two new scenes, one of the emperor uh, condemning Acacius and his troops to martyrdom. It's interesting that the pose of the emperor is clearly inspired by one of Michelangelo's statues, actually both statues of Lorenzo and Duca di Urbino and Giuliano Duca di Nemur from Michelangelo's tombs in the Sacrestia Nuova in San Lorenzo. And uh, the, other of the, the other new scene is this scene, which was added, uh, of the crucifixion of the 10,000 on Mount Ararat. Pontormo transferred the group of fighting soldiers and the baptism scene in the background directly from the drawing to the painting, using the drawing as a sort of a little cartoon, as a cartonetto, but sketched the emperor and the crucifixion into, onto the, into the panel freehand with a paintbrush, as revealed by recent scientific investigations. The Hamburg drawing was also employed for the second version of the martyrdom, a painting, according to Vasari, executed for Carlo Neroni. Even though Vasari ascribes both, painting to, both paintings to Pontormo, since 1955, scholars have almost unanimously attributed the second painting, which you see here on the screen, in the Uffizi, to Bronzino, on the basis of important stylistic differences between the two. It is possible that after he received the commission from Carlo Neroni, Pontormo assigned it to his student. Notably, Vasari says that Pontormo used scarcely ever to allow himself to be helped by his assistants or to suffer them to lay a hand on that which he intended to execute with his own hand. And when he did, and, and when he did wish to avail himself of one of them, chiefly in order they might learn, he allowed them to do the whole work by themselves. Bronzino used Pontormo's drawing as a cartoon for his version of the martyrdom, faithfully transferring the various groups of figures from the paper to the panel and arranging them in a coherent composition quite close to Pontormo's original design. For the crucifixion scene that is not part of the drawing, uh, Bronzino turned to the painting meant for the Ospedale degli Innocenti, which he likely had directly before him, or which he at least knew well from memory. The reason why Carlo Neroni would have wanted a version of this composition for himself is not known, but we can speculate why. Neroni was around 19 years old when Florence was besieged, and like all of his fellow citizens between 18 and 36 years of age who had not abandoned the city, he probably enlisted in the Republican militia. If devotion to St. Acacius and the 10,000 martyrs was particularly strongly felt during outbreaks of the plague, there, was also strong there were also strong affinities between the struggles and the sufferings of the Florentines decimated by war and plague during the siege and the tragedy of the martyrs. The fact that Bronzino included a city view which with clear affinities with the view with some view, uh, buildings in Florence, the dome, the cupola, uh, Bray Brunelleschi, and the, perhaps the Pitti Palace, um, in the fact that uh, I was saying that Bronzino included the city view uh, in which we can recognize some elements of the uh, city of Florence would seem to stress the relationship between the painted legend and Florence's recent history. Like his fellow citizens, Carlo Neroni was deeply involved in these events, whose memory would be kept alive forever by the painting. When Francis Russell, in 2008, rediscovered this painting, which is exhibited here in the show, he suggested that it was the portrait of the Florentine nobleman Carlo Neroni mentioned by Vasari in his life of Pontormo. We know very little about Carlo, and even less about his youth, but he belonged to the family descended from Dieti Salvi Neroni, 
who had been banished from Florence in 1466 for his part in the failed conspiracy after, uh, against Piero de' Medici. So he was sort of um, part of a sort of an anti-Medician family. We know that uh, in 1530, Carlo married Caterina Capponi, daughter of the rich merchant Giuliano Capponi, and niece of Niccolò Capponi, who had been elected gonfaloniere of the Florentine Republic in 1527. The young man, uh, Caterina, had died before 1539 when Carlo married a second, for a second time with Elisabetta Martelli. The young man has indeed a ring on his uh, finger, and the letter he is tucking into his doublet was considered a possible allusion to his marital sta status. However, the young man's appearance, his stern and rapt expression, which recalls that of important Florentine civic symbols like Donatello's St. George for the proud and almost defiant gaze and the statues of David by Donatello and Verrocchio for the elegantly nonchalant pose with his hand resting on his left hip, suggest that the portrait was likely commissioned with a political intent. Carlo Neroni was 19 years old in 1530, an age that is perfectly compatible with the appearance of the young man in the painting. And given his family's traditional democratic beliefs, he had probably enlisted in the Republican militia. Actually, our very recent discovery after the exhibition uh, catalog was written, made by Alessandro Cech in the archives of Florence, definitely, prove uh, definitely proves that Carlo Neroni was enlisted in the Florentine Republican militia. The young man in Pontormo's painting seems to be caught in the act of hiding or retrieving a note from his jacket, perhaps a secret message with important contents. Unfortunately, the letters that can be read on the folded piece of paper uh, do not help resolve the issue of his identity or the circumstances surrounding the commission of the painting. The young man, uh, on the other side, is the quintessence of masculine elegance of the time. He wears a jointly perched red cap a white shirt of which we can barely discern the cuffs and collar since it is covered by a wide-sleeved gray satin doublet, very elegant, um, and uh, over which is a fitted leather jerkin, characterized by its vertical slashes, these open slashes, and an elegant ornamental motif at the shoulders. His clothing closely recalls the garments worn by the three traitors who were sentenced to death in 1530 and portrayed by Andrea del Sarto in a series of drawings now in the Uffizi and Chatsworth collections. And so this sort of jacket, this jacket and also the... Um, um, Hands. and also recalls the costume uh, um, of this uh, man portrayed by Andrea del Sarto um, uh, on this portrait of a man with a sword also by Andrea del Sarto. So this is a study for a portrait, probably the portrait would have been this, you know, this size, but he's, Andrea is adding the whole figure here, and you see the uh, kind of cap, and again, this sort of uh, jacket over a doublet. Um, uh, so also by Andrea Dan, uh, re, um, uh, realized in the same moment. As the diarist Agostino Lapini recorded, you can go back to the portrait, uh, as the contemporary diarist Agostino Lapini recorded, it was during the siege that Florentine men abandoned the traditional hood for hats and caps, cappelli e berrette, and above all began to cut their hair short, while prior to the siege they wore 
their hair long down to their shoulders. Si cominciarono a mozzare i capelli che innanzi detto assedio ognuno portava la zazzera in sino sulle spalle. The youth's watchful expression, along with his stately pose and the severe yet sophisticated elegance of both his clothing and bearing, have been rightly compared to the halberdier in the Getty Museum. Considered one of the most beautiful portraits of the Italian Cinquecento, the halberdier by Pontormo is also one of the most widely debated paintings for its dating and for the sitter's identity. Who, who was it, uh, when was it painted? Who is this mysterious, vigorous, vigorously proud young man dressed with aristocratic elegance in the red and white of the Florentine coat of arms, a costume embellished with a gold chain and a badge on the hat, depicting the mythical combat between Hercules and the giant Anteus, pinned to this cap, with his sword at his side and leaning on a halberd as if we were protecting one of the city's bastions visible from the back. Is he the young Francesco Guardi, who in a Florence besieged by the imperial troops that came to restore the Medici to power, had himself portrayed as a vigorous defender of the Florentina Libertas, of the freedom of Florence? Or, he is, or is he the young Cosimo de' Medici, son of Giovanni delle Bande Nere, who from Sion of a secondary branch of the family was unexpectedly elevated to the rank of Duke after, in 1537, after his cousin Alessandro was assassinated. Both these hypotheses were, you know, made by scholars. These two conflicting interpretations have, have a decisive impact on the dating of the portrait. For the supporters of the Guardi hypothesis, the painting, like me, the painting should be dated to the dramatic months of the siege of Florence. So between October 29 and August 30, or maybe a little bit before. For those who support the Cosimo I hypothesis, the portrait should be dated slightly after August 1537, when the 18-year-old newly installed Duke of Florence returned victoriously from the Battle of Montemurlo, where he definitely defeated the pro-republic coalition and consolidated his power over the city. However, the Cosimo I hypothesis comes up against a series of real problems. First of all, the resemblance to the documented portraits of the second Duke of Florence. I show, I show you here three examples of portraits of Cosimo de' Medici uh, realized between the late uh, 1530s and the early 1540s by three different artists, Pontormo in a profile, por profile portrait drawing, Bronzino in an allegorical portrait of Cosimo as Orpheus, and the famous bust today in the Bargello in Florence by Baccio Bandinelli. The early portraits of the young duke uh, executed uh, between the late 1530s and the early years of the following decade always emphasize his strong-willed personality, the thin face with its strong jaw, high forehead, prominent nose, and mouth with the protruding lower lip, none, none of which corresponds to the round face um, with its low forehead, the small mouth with fleshy lips, uh, and our halberdier's gaze that is somewhere between dreamy and apprehensive. Furthermore, the halberdier's lavish and showy clothing would not have been appropriate to Cosimo's new ducal rank, and he was entirely out of fashion for a portrait painted in 1537. And we do know that, and I quote from a contemporary source, during the early years of his reign, Cosimo dressed in the Florentine style, with costume and cape not unlike the Spanish style, and always wore somber shades of tan or black. Not even the hat badge with Hercules and Anteus can prove that this is a portrait of the new Duke of Florence. It is true that Cosimo used an image of Hercules as a symbol, but he did so to emphasize the continuity with the Florentine Republican tradition. Hercules appeared, in fact, on the city's seal since 
12, um, 12, 18, um, 12, in, since the 13th century, symbolizing the struggle against tyranny. However, the strongest argument against the identification of this painting as a portrait of Cosimo I is the chronology, since the style, composition, and the sitter's clothing fit perfectly into Pontormo's development and the end of the 1520s. Dating the Getty portraits to the late 1520s leads to the conclusion that it may well be the portrait of Francesco Guardi, in abito di soldato, dressed as a soldier, which Vasari celebrated as an opera bellissima, a most beautiful work, painted during the siege of Florence. Francesco, born in 1514 and therefore around 15 or 16 years old, is depicted standing the night watch in front of a bastion of the city walls, most likely on one of his properties called La Piazzuola, opposite the church of San Miniato, which was threatened by the enemy's artillery. Even if Francesco was too young to be officially part of the Florentine militia, we do know from uh, Florentine historians of the, of the 16th century that many young men, and I quote here, who were not more than 15 or 16 years old, follow their fathers on inspections and patrols. And that these Florentine youths offered, and I quote again from the historian, Florentine historian of the 16th century, Benedetto Varchi, they offered the most beautiful sight because they were as well armed as they were sp splendidly dressed. The short hair and cap, as we have seen for Carlo Neroni, for the potential portrait of Carlo Neroni, speak to a fashion uh, which became popular as we, have seen in Flor as we have seen in Florence during the siege, while the badge with Hercules and Anteus points to the Republic's mortal battle against tyranny. In the only surviving preparatory drawing for the halberdier, which you can see here on the right, Pontormo devoted his attention to the sitter's fashionable attire and weapons. He did not focus on the subject's features with the same level of scrutiny and may have used a workshop assistant to model the costume. Pontormo perhaps originally planned a frontal pose for the portrait, as you can see from the drawing. Uh, or he chose to study his model from this angle to facilitate his examination of specific costume details. This sheet can be compared with another drawing executed almost at the same time and presented in the exhibition. In the exhibition, you can see this side of the drawing, which leaves no doubt that it is prepa preparatory to a portrait but no, no, not for the halberdier and non for the, uh, Carlo, for the Carlo Neroni. Uh, corresponding to an advanced stage of the creative process. The drawing is the outcome of a process Jacopo began with the two studies on the verso, which seem to record the earliest phases of the image. On the, on the right is a sketch here, on the right is a sketch for developing the pose and proportions. The analytic attempt to suggest volumes through insistent and closely overlaid lines suggests that the artist was working from a three-dimensional model. On the left, we see the same figure repeated, now squared, and seem wearing the doublet and sword belt. As in other portrait studies, Jacopo showed a keen interest in the details of garments, as we have seen, for example, in the preparatory drawing for the halberdier. The presence of the squaring implies a further step in the design process, specifically the transfer of the image to another, now probably lost, sheet that would have preceded the, this figure on the verse, on the recto, for which the unknown sitter may have actually posed. Pontormo's halberdier was a key model for later paintings by his pupil Bronzino, 
especially for the portrait of Guidobaldo della Rovere, Duke of Urbino, painted during a period when Bronzino was working at the court of Urbino from around 1530 to 1532. Bronzino was quite familiar with the halberdier, since always, according to Vasari, he had painted its cover with the depiction of Pygmalion appealing to Venus to endow the ivory sculpture he was making with the spirit of life, transforming the solid, innate material into living skin and bones. So the cover was basically, sorry, the cover was basically another panel which was hiding the portrait. It was probably originally hinged with the, with, the, the, with the panel containing the portrait. It was hiding, it was a sort of an allegorical commentary or an allegorical addition to the portrait. There are several examples in the Renaissance. I put in this slide a couple of examples. One, Florentine by, an art, by Giuliano Bugiardini, where you see the portrait of this lady called La, La Monaca. Uh, with her allegorical cover. And then a northern example by a, a, an artist working in Venice, Lorenzo Lotto, the portrait of Bishop Bernardo de Rossi, with, uh, again, its allegorical cover, which uh, is uh, uh, emphasizing the pa two different paths toward, toward the virtue and vice. And so this was covering the portrait of the bishop. So the... the painting with Pygmalion by Bronzino uh, was the cover of the halberdier. If we believe, obviously, in the theory that uh, the halberdier is the portrait of Francesco Guardi, since Vasari says that for the portrait of Francesco Guardi, Bronzino executed the cover. In calling up the artist's ability to imbue his subjects with life, Bronzino seems with foresight to anticipate Pontormo's famous response to Benedetto Varchi's inquiry among artists on the respective merits of painting and sculpture, an inquiry that this literary figure of 16th century Florence, Benedetto Varchi, made in 1547, sort of interviewing artists and uh, urging them to write their opinion on the superiority of painting or sculpture. Obviously, different artists, there were, uh, there were sculptors and painters, and they defended their sort of, uh, their own field. The great Florentine painter, so Pontormo, wrote in his, uh, um, in his uh, um, uh, respo uh, response that the ultimate goal of painting is to exceed nature in wanting to give spirit to a figure and make it seem alive and do so in two dimensions. Shortly before, Pontormo painted the protagonist of the exhibition here at the Morgan. The Visitation, now universally considered one of Pontormo's greatest achievements, greatest masterpieces, which was vi virtually unknown until its rediscovery and publication by Carlo Gamba in 1904 was almost a totally forgotten picture. The almost abstract quality of the forms and the breathtaking palette of arresting colors in intense, saturated hues were widely admired over the course of the 20th century and ignited the imagination also of contemporary artists like Vil Viola, this is a famous work by Vil Viola of 1995 uh, entitled The Greeting, which was inspired by the visitation. And recorded by Vasari, the first secure notice of, um, of the work's existence occurred in 1677, when Giovanni Cinelli mentioned it in his expanded edition of Francesco Bocchi's Le Bellezze della Città di Firenze, sort of a guide of the city, of the beauty, artistic beauty of the city of Florence, written at the end, published at the end of the 16th century and republished with Cinelli's edition in 1677. Cinelli, concerned with identifying works of art located in Florence, was not describing Pontormo's painting, however, but its modello, 
then in the house of the senator Andrea Pitti in Via Guicciardini. Cinelli notes secondarily the existence of the completed altarpiece for which the drawing was made, stating his belief that it was located in a villa belonging to the Pinadori family near Carmignano. Subsequently, the painting is recorded in 1720 and later on in 1833 in its present location, the Church of San Francesco in Carmignano, which you can see in this slide and you can see in, this, uh, in his altarpiece, which clearly was not uh, made, was not created. It's an 18th century altarpiece, which was not clearly created for the painting since this, this space around had to be you know, filled with these sort of wooden additions. The painting depicts the encounter, no, let's go back to, the painting depicts the encounter between the Virgin Mary and her cousin, Saint Elizabeth, recounted in the Gospel of Luke. Pontormo characterizes the city of Judah in the hill country where the two holy women meet as a specifically Tuscan urban environment. This is identifiable by its typical regional architectural features, such as the colors of the building themselves, the colors of the famous Pietra Serena, uh, sand and gray, like, um, which you know, commonly employed at the time uh, and visible today in numerous surviving examples in Florence and also with details like the stone bench here, uh, on which the minuscule male figures sit in the background to the left of the central group. But also of this strange building, which has uh, um, a lot in common with uh, depictions of the famous Carcere delle Stinche, the prison of the Stinche in Florence, which was then later on demolished during the 19th century. So this is something new, this sort of urban characterization of the meeting, because usually the encounter takes place, at least according to the gospel, within, inside the house of, uh, or in the garden of the house of Elizabeth. So this is a departure in some way from the traditional iconography. The two uh, minuscule figures are likely intended to represent Joseph and Zechariah, the husbands of the two pregnant cousins. This identification finds confirmation in the nearby donkey, which you cannot really see there, but you can see clearly uh, you, when you look at the painting in the gallery, the form of transportation most usually associated with the Virgin. And the donkey uh, and uh, some of these wonderful details like the bench, the two seated figures, and the careful depiction of aging plaster work on some of the buildings are among the exceptional details revealed by the recent uh, conservation treatment of the painting. The contrast with Pontormo's earlier depiction of the same subject in the fresco at the Santissima Annunziata in Florence is striking. The grand, crowded, almost theatrical presentation of the earlier fresco is transformed here into an essential, compact image dominated by the towering volumes of the female figures and by their intricate draperies. Probably Pontormo was inspired by the earlier depiction of the same subject of one of his teachers, Mariotto Albertinelli, a composition also characterized by the same solemn, austere monumentality, if we really want to find a sort of a precedent for this very striking depiction of the visitation. As the setting employed by Pontormo is an urban exterior, he provided the two saintly protagonists with handmaidens following a long established Florentine visual tradition. One of the earliest examples of this compositional idea uh, occurs in the mosaics of the baptistry of Florence here a structure whose prestige guaranteed the replication and imitation of its decoration by local artists over the course of several centuries. 
In both the medieval prototype and the 16th century painting, St. Elizabeth is shown at almost the same height as the Virgin, and is not depicted bowing in deference to the future mother of God. This suggests that Pontormo patron, we can go back to the painting, this suggests that Pontormo's patron wished to demonstrate special reverence towards St. John the Baptist, as the visitation is not only the first prodigious confirmation of the, ministry, of the mystery of the incarnation, but also the beginning of the Baptist ministry. The urban setting of Pontormo's painting, the long Florentine tradition of the compositional type he employed, and this important indication of devotion to the cult of the city's patron saint, may suggest that the altarpiece was originally commissioned for a location in Florence, as it is suggested by Bruce Edelstein, the co-curator of this exhibition, in his brilliant essay in the exhibition catalogue. The most likely patron for the work was already suggested some years ago by uh, another American scholar, Elizabeth Pilliod, uh, and was probably Bonaccorso Pinadori, so was a member of the Pinadori family to which the painting, uh, uh, you know, uh, which owned the painting in the 17th century. But Bonaccorso Pinadori, his figure was reconstructed and some documents were found by Elizabeth Pilliod, was an apothecary who regularly sold artist supplies to both Pontormo and Bronzino. And it is therefore tempting to hypothesize that the patron himself supplied the pigments used by the artist. In any case, a patron who regularly dealt in such materials would surely have had a special appreciation for the prominence of their display, achieved through Pontormo's highly original use of color in the painting. The visitation has long been identified as owing a significant debt to the composition of Durer's 1497 engraving with four naked women. Pontormo's admiration for northern prints and his citation in numerous works of motifs derived from Durer are well known. Indeed, his excessively German manner, I quote Vasari, was explicitly criticized by Vasari. Vasari's critique regarded especially the fresco cycle depicting stories from the Christ's Passion that Pontormo executed between 1523 and 1525, when he and Bronzino escaped to the, uh, to the Certosa, to the Charter House, Certosa del Galluzzo, during an outbreak of the plague in Florence. Probably at the time, Pontormo had limited us access to supplies of paper, limited access to living models, uh, and so he was more heavily using, he relied more heavily on prints. And so Durer um, uh, was, uh, was a sort of a ready-made prototype, you know, for as inspiration for many details in his frescoes. But we cannot discount the use of other sources from the artist, especially antique sources, like this Roman sarcophagus, or a similar sarcophagus, depicting a marriage scene, which could have provided a model not only for the gesture of greeting through interwined hands or arms, but also for subsidiary figures placed behind the protagonists, who look out at the viewer. Pontormo's placement of the figures in the visitation, emphasizing their verticality and compressing them towards the front of the picture plane, suggests indeed a source in relief sculpture. Pontormo so appears to have revisited this antique motif through his memory of Durer's print, which provided a powerful model for female anatomy, while suggesting the light movement of bare feet. Go back one second. It's interesting, this the motif of the feet in Durer's print and in Pontormo's altarpiece. Only one autograph preparatory drawing for the visitation survives, and the comparison of the drawing of the painting was uh, done 80 years ago in the direct comparison, and so it's this is an extraordinary opportunity for us in, with, to, in this exhibition to do ourselves this comparison, to look at the same time at the painting and the drawing. 
Although Cinelli described a modello for the painting in 1677, as I already mentioned, uh, a modello which was then in the collection of Senator Andrea Pitti, scholars have occasionally doubted that the known drawing correspond to this work. So, the scientific analysis of the visitation undertaken in relation to its recent cleaning confirms with greater certainty that the surviving drawing is indeed the painter's final modello, as no indication were found for the use of a cartoon, while infrared reflectography demonstrates that the squaring present on the drawing was replicated to enlarge the design on the panel. So, squaring, and probably the drawing was slightly trimmed on the left side, so you, you don't see in the drawing really this building, you just see the beginning of the building, you almost see the entire um, right side, and you see this is the infrared reflectography which we published in the catalog, and uh, the reflectography clearly demonstrates that the square in present of the drawing was replicated to enlarge the design into the panel. Both the drawing and the painting demonstrate Pontormo's lingering uncertainty about how to arrange and orient the four women's feet. So I go back to the drawing. This, this, is, the most, this is the part where there are most uncertainties and then they are in some way resolved, but still within, while he was painting, he was still pondering about the position of the feet. Then there are some other differences, especially here. There is the addition of this nice veil here. And here there are some differences. The position of the hand is slightly changed, but more or less the painting follow pretty, uh, in, a, in, a, in a pretty uh, faithful way, the model of the drawing. Um, but pentimenti, visible also to the naked eye, confirmed that this was only resolved during the work's execution. So this, uh, this is the area of major uncertainties while Pontormo was, executed the, was executing the painting. This exhibition represents not only an extraordinary opportunity to admire one of Pontormo's greatest masterpieces, and understand more about the artist's creative process, but also to raise awareness of the delicate and precarious condition of the Italian cultural patrimony, and in, and in particular of the church and the former monastic complex of Carmignano. As you can see here, when the visitation already started its journey, the beautiful portico of the church was accidentally badly damaged, was hit by a truck in a wrong maneuver, in the, in a, fortunately in an early morning, and was semi-destroyed. I would like to end this conversation with a short video which will make you aware of a crowdfunding campaign Um, organized by the parish chair to raise funds for the restoration of the former convent attached to the church. La nostra storia inizia nel 1211 quando San Francesco venne nelle nostre campagne secondo la tradizione e qui eh, costruì un primo nucleo di seguaci e favorì la costruzione di un primo convento che poi dopo è diventata la pieve dei Santi Michele e Francesco a Carmignano. La Pieve ha un grande valore per la comunità e è di per sé anche un, uno scrigno d'arte. Infatti conserva al suo interno la visitazione di Jacopo Carucci, detto il Pontormo, che è qua da diversi secoli. L'opera venne commissionata dalla nobile famiglia dei Pinadori, che erano dei mercanti di colori, che erano amici dei medici e avevano proprietà qua a Carmignano. I remember my own first encounter with the painting when I was an undergraduate student studying in Italy. I was brought by a teacher uh, to Carmignano and uh, the parish priest opened up the locked church and allowed us to come inside and I remember the magic of discovering a work as extraordinary as Pontormo's visitation in such an out-of-the-way setting. 
I have now had the good fortune to work with this painting as co-curator of an international exhibition in Florence, New York, and Los Angeles. Fontorma's visitation is traveling with an important message of preservation. Part of the magic of encountering art uh, in Italy is the joy of discovering uh, a work like the visitation in a place that we might not otherwise have visited. But the problem, of course, with maintaining artistic patrimony in such contexts is uh, ensuring its protection and safety. And uh, often the buildings that house these works are as old as the works themselves. Uh, they require um, enormous attention and care uh, in order to uh, keep them sound, healthy, and safe environments in which to preserve these works of art. The project of restore parte da un primo intervento indispensabile, il recupero del tetto. Vedete in che situazioni siamo. Dopodiché bisogna passare al ripristino delle murature. È necessario rendere di nuovo agibili le stanze del vecchio convento, compreso il refettorio e il chiostro, così come dobbiamo salvare dall'incuria l'oratorio della compagnia di San Luca con i suoi affreschi e le decorazioni ottocentesche. Questi spazi diventeranno non solo nuovamente il fulcro della vita sociale della nostra comunità, ma si apriranno alle visite da parte di amanti dell'arte di tutto il mondo. Noi vorremmo creare il nuovo Museo della Visitazione, un luogo per conservare e comunicare il capolavoro del Pontormo in quella che da sempre è la sua casa. Ecco, oggi abbiamo l'occasione di salvare dal degrado del tempo l'intero complesso della Pieve, a partire qua dal chiostro, dalla chiesa, da tutta l'area conventuale e dalla, dal suo nucleo originario che è la Cappella di San Luca. Per questo chiediamo il vostro contributo, perché vogliamo proteggere questo luogo, vogliamo restituirlo alla sua antica bellezza, vogliamo dare alla visitazione del contorno la cornice che si merita. So you have seen uh, the co-curator of the exhibition, which is sort of the other half of this project. Thank you very much.